Hello and welcome to our first UN 2023 Water Conference talk show coming to you live from the SDG studio here at UN headquarters in New York. My name is Shakuntala Santharan and uh, I will be your host for the next three days. So water, whether too little, too much or too polluted is the common thread that uh, runs through all the big challenges of our time from food to energy, migration, urbanization. Too much, too little, too polluted, water now threatens virtually every sustainable development goal and we are all vulnerable. The last time the world came together at this level over water was in 1977 in Argentina. Today, very aptly, is World Water Day, and this highly anticipated conference has just begun. In this first of six shows, we will dive deep into the expectations for this conference. First, let's take a look at how the conference began. Here's our reporter, Haja Yakubi. Okay, everyone, we're at a very special location right now. We're inside the water tunnel. Now, it's not just a special location, but also a very special timing because in a little bit, it is about to get opened officially by the King of the Netherlands and the President of Tajikistan. They will be welcomed in a little bit by Mina Guli, who is an ultra marathon runner. Now, one thing that's good to know about the marathons that Mina Guli has ran is that in each and every one of those marathons, she asks a company to be more mindful of their water use. So that was yesterday and now we're here at the very first day of the UN Water Conference. As you can see behind me, people are already starting to walk in because the official opening ceremony is about to start. Now I have the honor of doing that with none other than <laughs> Mavluda. Uh, the both of us will be on the stage in a little bit. Uh, of course we are super cool, calm and collected, but let, tell me about how you're really feeling right now. Uh, I mean a little bit nervous, but mostly super excited and I think we'll be fine because I'm doing it with you, Aww. so it'll be great. That's sweet, and likewise, if you could say one thing that you're looking forward to in the upcoming three days, what would it be? I mean, I'm from Tajikistan, so I'm very excited to see how much uh, of a role that my country has been taking part in this conference. Mm. Um, and I want to see the accumulation of the discourse that's been happening towards water action yeah. the past few years, um, and to see how it will impact the future of my country. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, and esteemed participants of the UN Water Conference. Good morning and welcome to this momentous occasion. We are now inspired by 10 different water-related actions which demand our attention. May this be a watershed moment for the world. That is our call of action to you. Okay, so that was the official opening of the ceremony, everyone. This means that the conference is officially open now. Really exciting to see what's to come. And I will say back to you, Shucks. Thank you very much, Haja. And Haja was a, the former UN Youth Representative for the Netherlands. We'll be hearing more from her over the next three days. Now, joining us here in the studio, we have Pablo Berecea Tua who is chair of the Global Water Partnership and founder of Berico, and also Hank Oving, who is the special envoy for international water affairs for the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Thank you both very much for joining us today. So if we could first uh, take a look back 50 years, almost 50 years at that first UN conference in Argentina, you used to be the former Secretary of Water Resources yeah. in Argentina. What actually happened in Mar del Plata in 1977? Well, uh, First of all, I'm very glad to be here. I, I, I was, I am a former Secretary of State in Argentina, but not at that time. Right. I, I was not. only five years old at that time. <laughs> but but uh, let me tell you very briefly that I think the 1977 summit was really an achievement. It was a very significant meeting. It came after the Stockholm 1972 meeting, and the whole system managed to gather 120 countries, which is a lot, for two weeks. And I think it was a breaking point in many senses, because it was a time when, where the ambition was really high, and also where the idea of valuing water and taking water as a real resource was also coming into place. So this was a conference with plenty of issues, a lot of political issues as well, in many senses. And one thing that I want to stress is that if you go back to the conclusions of that summit, they said at that time that by 1990, 
the universal service of water supply and sanitation should be already achieved. And that was a very major goal of the conference. Now we are now in 2023, and we know how far we are still from that. So this has to call us for some level of humbleness, but also a new energy to put together resources and capacities and really to solve the issue. That's what we're all certainly hoping for at this conference. Uh, the conference at the time approved the Mar del Plata Action Plan. Was any of that actually actualized? Yeah, there, was, uh, there were several uh, actions after that, and a lot of significant summits on particular issues were put together. So if you go back again to the discussion there, they were already considering to go for goals, as we have later on, and even we can go back to the sustainable development goals after that. But several of the main summits, including Dublin, uh, after uh, Mar del Plata, were a consequence of that discussion that initiated there. And there was a general feeling uh, at that time that we were able to solve it, but also we, are f we were facing a crisis. And uh, as we now realize, the crisis is still here, and we haven't already solved it. It's gotten worse, yeah. actually. Right, Hank? So have the issues shifted? The situation has changed in the 46 years. Yeah, it has actually it hasn't gotten better uh, to say. Uh, we put water sanitation and hygiene on the agenda in Mar del Plata. We put integrated water resource management. So a very holistic approach to the issue of water. What we didn't put on the agenda then was on the agenda, but did not Im implement was putting water in the context of everything else. So everything after Mar del Plata was water. Uh, but not so much in the context of a whole of society approach. We wished for that, but it never got there. And the follow-up of Mar del Plata therefore was lacking uh, that capacity uh, and that buy-in politically as well as from society. Now, 46 years later, we bring the world to New York for the second ever United Nations Water Conference. And it shows we have over close to 7,000 participants signing up for this conference being non-governments. We have mayors from across the world, private sector, NGOs, academics, activists, youth, uh, women from all over, next to close to 200 national delegations coming here for New York to take action on water. But the same is at stake as was at stake in Mar del Plata. Will we have a follow-up? That is the big question. That is the big question. Yeah, yeah. So, so has our attitude towards water, how we value water, changed in all these years? I wish I could say uh, for the better. I must say no. We've been putting water in its box, perceived it as a very technical issue. When the water wasn't there, think of calling the plumber to open the tap. Uh, we never perceived it as a whole of society issue in its connection to food, energy, climate, biodiversity, our economies and our cities. We came one and a half years ago, so not so long ago, a food system summit. Can you imagine food security without water security? We can't. Well, one and a half years ago, the world agreed on a food systems outcome without even mentioning water. So we're way far from incorporating water in everything we have. At the same time, there's a lot of hope. Uh, last COP in Sharm el Sheikh, was the first time water was incorporated in the outcome document. We had the biodiversity a summit in Montreal, the Kunmin Montreal CBD, where fresh water now got a firm place. Uh, and a couple of weeks ago, the Far Oceans Agreement got us on track uh, after 24 years of negotiation and saying, OK, we have to protect this vital resource. So in a way, we're in a good place. We're also in a good place because water shows that we can come together it's kind of a safe place too, because it is connected to everything else, everything. be it out before be becoming contested. But now we have to capitalize it. There's a lot of responsibility on the world, on world leaders, but also on activists, on youth and more experienced generations, on public and private actors to take action and seek opportunities to bring that forward. Because if we don't commit to the follow-up, if we don't organize ourselves accordingly, then this conference was just another, you know, not a, another drop on a hot, too hot plate. So now one more question for both of you. Uh, if we could start with you, Pablo. So 
as we've been hearing, it's crucial, right, yeah. for life, for everything, really. Water, you need water for, for so many elements of life. So why has it taken the world so long to come back together again at this level? You mentioned political yeah. issues yeah. earlier. I'd like to point out to a couple of issues that I think are very significant. One of them is value of water. Water is a common good and it should be a universal right. Now, at the same time, it's a key ingredient for the economy. And we will see that even more so in the, in the next years because of climate change. Climate change is actually happening sooner than we were expecting, and it is about water. So if we don't solve water, we will have so many issues regarding our economics in the countries and the regions that are going to be significant. And this will also drive, I think, the political interest. Because as soon as we see that water is not there, or we have too much or too little, then the consequences trigger political issues. So I'm very positive and optimistic that we will be using this event, and it's going to be as important as it was in 1977, but closer in time. We will reach a lot of, uh, of positive outcomes if we pay attention to the consequences in terms of value of water and in terms of politics. Hank, your thoughts? Why it took so long, eh, your question? Uh, I think uh, we ignore, tried to ignore it a bit, put it away, uh, overused and abused this water. We broke the hydrological cycle, as being set by the Global Commission on the Economics of Water. Now we have to bring it back again. Uh, there's a possibility for that. So I share your, your feeling of hope, because water, while being devastating and impactful, can also be a solution broker, a space where we can come together. So I think that is... The, the issue now, can we use this conference as a way to come together, but then also organize ourselves accordingly to stay together and stick to our promises and not only implement those solutions, but scale and replicate them and get to better governance, better valuing and management to ensure that we have a just, resilient and inclusive world. I think that is at stake here at the conference. That's what Secretary General Guterres made very clear this morning. This is not a water conference. This is a, water, is a conference where water is the mechanism to drive sustainable development for all everywhere. And we can do it, I'm pretty sure. But it will take guts uh, from all of us eh, against the vested interest and the practices of the past to reinvent that future with the youth, with innovative concepts and inclusive governance. I look forward to do this with the world, of course. We, we brought the world here and now we have to go out to the world and do whatever we can to make this uh, an inclusive, resilient, and sustainable water secure world. Hank, you mentioned the uh, Global Commission on the Economics yeah. of Water. We are going to be uh, speaking uh, to some of the co-chairs and commissioners of the commission uh, tomorrow, and we will hear about their recommendations. Thank you both so very much. So let's hope the world can get past these differences and come together to solve this crisis. The world needs it. Uh, good intentions in Argentina, but that didn't translate into enough action. Let's hope the commitments and the talking that happens at this conference does translate into real and tangible action. Pablo and Hank, thank you both very much for your vital perspective. Now, let's take a look at how some young people feel about our water crisis. Small island developing states like those here in the Caribbean are amongst those most seriously impacted by the effects of climate change. Because of this, all stakeholders, especially local governments and the youth, need to be part of the discussion. We have much to learn from you and you have much to learn from us. How can we better incorporate youth and local governments of small island developing nations into global decision-making processes? Behind me, you see a lake that didn't exist 10 years ago. This is an outcome of glacial lake outboard floods, which often result in catastrophic flooding downstream with major infrastructure and socioeconomic impacts. How can we increase countries' understanding of risks and respond to early warning before disaster strike? In my home country, about 65% of women and girls cannot manage their periods in a safe way. This puts their health very much at risk. How can we empower women?
So clearly a lot of work lies ahead. Uh, the world is not on track to meeting SDG 6, which is the uh, uh, SDG 6, which is clean water and sanitation for all by 2030. So how does the world get back on track? Uh, let's find out now what our other guests think are possible during this conference. And we have with us uh, Dr. Abdullah Nasir, who is Minister of State for Environment, Climate Change and Technology of the Maldives. Uh, Akona Kotieni is project lead for the South African Youth Parliament for Water. And Yunia Musazi is executive director of the Uganda Water and Sanitation Network. Thank you all very much uh, for being here with us in the studio. So one of the principles of this conference is inclusiveness. We heard Hank talking about the many different types of delegates who are here now. Some 1,200 organizations have received special accreditation. There's definitely a buzz in the air. We can feel it walking through the halls here at the UN headquarters. And participants and stakeholders of all kinds are here and engaged. So Dr. Nasir, what will you be looking for? for in terms of inclusiveness at this conference and what does it mean to your country uh, this water conference as a, a small island developing nation thank you for inviting us um, I think it's important to uh, in, a, in a conference of this state this is where we can uh, come up with like-minded um, states especially coming from a small island uh, developing state uh, we would like to share and also experience what others are doing, what um, countries like uh, in the Caribbean, uh, in the Pacific, and also in the Indian Ocean. Um, there are technologies that are developing towards um, uh, providing water to uh, smaller communities, smaller island communities, and understand and share experiences with them. So that's what I would think uh, inclusiveness uh, for me would be uh, to, um, to involve uh, as much as uh, the, the, the small island communities. Okay, we're going to look at uh, what that means uh, uh, right after this. Akona, what about you? Why are you at the conference? Um, I'd like to first say also thank you for having me here today. And I think what we what we were trying to attempt with our campaign is trying to broadcast the voices of young South Africans, especially the voices of young black women who are usually um, isolated and not included in the conversations. So I think it's a privilege to be able to be here today as a young black South African woman, because I think um, as the previous conversation said that water and sanitation sometimes um, does not include you know, other factors. So it's water is usually looked at in isolation from other challenges. So I think um, I'm just honored to be here. And I feel like what I'm expecting from inclusive, inclusivity is seeing more young people involved. So I've seen a couple of our delegates from the South African Youth Parliament for Water and our partner World Merit on a couple of panels speaking at the World Economic Forum, for example. So I think that's what inclusivity looks like for me is seeing people of color, seeing people from Africa, marginalized people on the panels, seeing them having the opportunity to share their tech, te te technical expertise on those panels as well and not just being seen as tokenist young people who just you know should have like a small snippet to just express how they feel but we actually have the knowledge and expertise behind that as well. And Yunia, what about you? You are uh, in charge of an uh, director of an umbrella organization of uh, water NGOs in Uganda and you would like to see more women on water committees, what does this conference mean for your organization? Thank you so much. Uh, we do appreciate uh, the conference making sure that the voices of civil society, you know, are incorporated in the, in the discussions and uh, preparations for this conference. One thing we, we need to take note of is that, yes, you've mentioned we're lacking behind in universal access to water and sanitation. And more so, this is threatened by the onset of climate change. And we're all aware that women are the centerpiece of um, ensuring that water and sanitation are availed at household level. However, many times they're not at the decision-making tables in terms of management um, or delivery of the water and sanitation services in different countries. So what we are here to do, and also currently, um, different studies indicate that less than 50 countries 
uh, policies and laws have highlighted and um, prioritized women being at the center place of all this uh, decision making regards to water and sanitation. So what we're here to do as civil society organizations and also different governments and states is to make sure that gender and, and inclusion are at the center stage of all the key commitments that are coming in from the different countries. Um, different partners like Simavi, UASnet, and also my, my government, Minister of Water and Environment, are organizing a session tomorrow that's solely focusing um, and, and bringing on board different practitioners, both government and uh, CSOs, depicting how they're supporting governments in different countries to address and make sure that women are at the center stage um, in decision making. So what we call for, what this session is also looking for, is to ensure that yes, as we prioritize and talk about financing, you know, especially now um, that there's so much financing around climate change, an assessment that was done between 2016 and 2022 all the financing that was coming in to address climate change, only 3% uh, incorporated financing for water. So what we are calling for is that since you cannot address climate change without prioritizing water and sanitation, we should advocate for WASH to be incorporated within this financing. But also, as WASH financing is prioritized, and uh, I think it's the Glass report which reported that we are lacking behind, we have a funding gap of more than 100 billion US dollars. We should make sure that this financing is based on locally led solutions that are addressing um, barriers that have been identified by the local communities, but also women are involved in identifying these barriers. And they're also invested in to take leadership in the solutions um, to address uh, accessibility of water and sanitation. But lastly, as all the countries, you know, um, come to this conference with, with commitments, we have civil society who've contributed to many of these commitments. And uh, we are calling for both governments and development partners and the civil society themselves uh, to make sure that these commitments, yes, foster, you know, uh, women leadership, you know, and also financing of the marginalized communities, including the youth and, and the women. But we should all be held accountable, you know, to make sure that once we live here, the commitments that we made before in different forums and the commitments that we're going to make here today, you know, uh, for the rest of the week are fulfilled. Whether by the states themselves, whether by the development partners or us as civil society. Thank you. Union. We're going to look a little bit more at uh, how women are affected by this water crisis right after this. First, uh, Dr. Nasir, I wanted to look at uh, the challenges, the water challenges that your country, that small island nations are facing. The situation is, is, is urgent, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, as a small island uh, nation like others um, as well, even within the small island uh, developing states, there are coral reef countries, coral reef uh, dependent countries um, that uh, has the most challenges to um, groundwater actually. And uh, we in the Maldives have uh, run out of um, well, drinkable water for, for a long time, a long time ago, and we have to find, urgently find uh, innovative and technological solutions to that. Uh, we in the Maldives live on, we, we have 1,200 islands and where we live, uh, in, uh, we live on 186 islands. Uh, 150 plus resorts are um, tourist hotels and a number of other islands. So in, these individual islands are uh, used for different purposes and you can imagine the difficulties that they may have whether it's an industry or with the people living, people's health, you know. Uh, when we run out of water, uh, we can feel it in the Maldives. And uh, we have found solutions um, some 20, 25 years ago, uh, we have invested on um, uh, making water out of salt water, well, commonly called desalination. But desalination is a very expensive process uh, and uh, the, the energy consumption is very high. And, and so it becomes very expensive as well. So at a conference like this, uh, I think it's high time we uh, find out the technological innovations that are, in effect, you know, uh, whether you can use renewable energies uh, to, um, to 
to, to uh, make water uh, out of seawater. Um, and, and, and we also have to um, effectively, especially for small island states where you have limited sources of water, you have the underground uh, water, which is very limited, you have rainwater, and then you, uh, you also have um, desalinated water. So maybe it's best to find out um, how the integrated water resources management you know, works and how you can utilize all available sources of water to provide um, cheaper uh, water solutions for the communities. You know. So we, we look forward to um, find out uh, technologies and innovations you know, where, where we, can, uh, we can address um, water shortages. And, 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 and without that, we wouldn't be able to address um, water issues uh, on small island states. You talked about desalination. I'm from Singapore, and uh, we are a water score, so scarce uh, island uh, nation as well. And desalination is definitely one of the technologies that the country is investing in. Of course, if we can invest and adopt these uh, technologies at scale, mm -hmm. that would help reduce the cost, mm -hmm. right? So, Yunya, we were talking earlier about women and uh, what that means this water crisis means for them. I think a lot of people at home might not know uh, that gender equality and the water crisis are also linked. Uh, we have a short video from uh, Kenya first to see what the situation there is for women. Let's take a look at this. So, Yuni, how are women in uh, your country affected by the water crisis? How does their experience differ from that of men? Um, like I mentioned before, I think this relates to most people from developing countries. It's the role of women and young girls who ensure that water is available at household level. So you find that with a lack of access to clean water, which may mean that they have to walk a long distance to access this clean water, that means that they put in so much effort and they lose time when they're walking, you know, to earn flow to get uh, this clean water. This time would have been used for more productive, you know, other productive areas to improve on their livelihoods, either tilling in the garden, you know, or looking after their family or cooking. So in addition to that, as they go on to ensure that the water is availed at household level, uh, at times you find that those have to work long distances, they find challenges like what has been shown in the Kenya uh, video. So they end up coming home and maybe the husbands, you know, query, where have you been? You've taken long. At times it's not predicted for how long you take, you know, um, to fetch these waters. So they end up being abused at household level. Then the young girls uh, who have to go to school at times have to put in, even the youth have to put in time uh, to first fetch water for the household before they go to school. So they lose. By the time they get to school, they may be, you know, tired or even give up going to school after putting in time to fetch water. Then the young girls who are menstruating, you know, the youth who are menstruating, end up, you know, on average, losing more than 30 days in a year, you know, because of lack of uh, availability of uh, clean water when they have to, when they're menstruating and they have to change, you know, or want to have a bath uh, because there's no clean water. Uh, the toilets um, um, are not really available. In my country, you find that um, um, toilets in Uganda, one toilet stance has an average of 70 pupils. So the time that's required, the limited time provided for students to go to the toilets, they spend it lining up. So young girls who are menstruating, they may end up, you know, just abandoning going to school those three days in a month, you know, when they're having their periods. Then in addition to that, um, clean water and sanitation are not only available at household at school, but also in healthcare facilities. In Uganda, um, only 4% of the healthcare facilities have um, access to clean, um, to clean water. So you find that the women, the children, who have gone to these healthcare facilities to attain 
you know, better health, end up getting cont contamination from other germs and diseases because there's no clean water and there's no toilet facility. Akona, you advocate uh, for gender equality as well and uh, for youth in your work as an activist. How severe is the water crisis in your country, South Africa, where, of course, water shortages and, and droughts are, you know, common? I think what is so sad, and it's what we've tried to capture in our campaign, is the sentiment which was spoken about earlier, which is too little water, too much water, and water pollution. So in our campaign, we went to different communities in South Africa. So I know... Um, KZN, which is KwaZulu-Natal, is the one which is, has from prominent flooding, which was last year was a big, um, the biggest flooding in a couple of years. So I think what is difficult in South Africa is that we always expected that we will always be a water-scarce country. But now with the climate effects, um, we're seeing other unpredictable you know, water challenges. So I know in Gauteng and Pumalanga, because of the mining and the air quality, we have now water pollution. And then in Durban, and sorry, in Cape Town and other regions such as Port Elizabeth, we're seeing the water scarcity. So I think what, is, what has become a more evident thing now in South Africa is that water is a wicked problem. We can't look at it in silos whereby we like, we need to look at groundwater, for example, for water scarcity only, but we need to look at the complexities of the water crisis across the board. So I think we've fixated too much on spending effort in, on one crisis instead of looking at the, say, all the crises at the same time. So I think now that affects us as young people because, as you mentioned, um, a lot of young people now have don't have access to basic water because we have a big crisis of load shedding in South Africa currently. So when it gets to stage six or stage seven of the electricity crisis, so that's four hours of um, power cuts four three times a day. So when that gets to that level, the power, the water pumps can't pump out water. So basically now you have an electricity crisis and a water crisis. And then that's also not predictable. So then younger people aren't also aware of when to plan and predict, and especially with young girls and menstruation and health and safety, because young women now, because the water doesn't come out of your tap, you need to walk very far and you didn't predict that. And we have also high crime stats in South Africa, which is a sad thing as well for us as young people. So we are very vulnerable to the effects of, you know, the, the chain of, if you neglect the electricity crisis, for example, there's a water crisis, there's a safety crisis, and then it just has a ripple effect. So I think that's the problem with us, is that the water crisis has always been seen as water scarcity. And I think it's about time our government starts looking at all the challenges across the board. Thank you for showing us uh, so clearly with that example how everything is connected, sure. right? Energy, water, food. Uh, so. Let's look at uh, solutions and commitments now that the conference can help showcase and help us get back on track with these SDGs. Uh, Dr. Nasir, so solutions are clearly needed in the Maldives. What are some of the things that you're already working on, uh, perhaps with other island uh, nations, and what kind of commitment are you hoping for from this conference? Um, yes, uh, as I said, uh, small island Small islands are very um, uh, special. Uh, they have special circumstances as well. And uh, running out of water, as I said, is the main, uh, main issue. Uh, I, I, I think as we go along, um, uh, we will have to uh, face more sh water shortages and uh, health issues as well relating to um, the end water. I can give you an example. Um, in, the, uh, in the early 70s, for example, when um, v with the... Um, with the way that we were using water at the moment, uh, at, at that time, you know, waterborne diseases were rampant uh, in the Maldives. But, but we have overcome that um, over, over the past um, almost 40, 50 years. We have overcome uh, the uh, issue of waterborne diseases, you know. So we have to learn from that um, journey of how we came and uh, went about and, and how we can improve on that, you know. So that's water, water and health is also a very important issue. Uh, so here in, in, in this conference, having, uh, having this sort of a conference after a very long time, as we can all see, uh, I, I think uh, we, we, we have a lot to learn from uh, similarities and differences that we have and uh, how we can build on what we have uh, done over the past 50 years, you know, and um, uh, find really modern, innovative solutions, you know, and technology uh, that can alleviate our problems. 
So we've been talking about uh, water shortages. What about flooding with uh, rising sea levels? Yes, that is uh, a very important for low-lying uh, um, island states uh, like the Maldives. We constantly face uh, the issue of uh, flooding and inundation. And uh, with that also come, um, uh, because we have um, limited groundwater uh, uh, sources, um, they get saline very quickly, you know, with the flooding issues. So um, with that, uh, we have to come up with, so not only water, but we, ha we also have to face with better coastal protection for, um, for smaller island, uh, low-lying states. And that's, we have, we have developed, um, we are constantly working on that uh, to have uh, better solutions for uh, coastal um, erosion, coastal management, coastal inundation. Uh, that is also something that we constantly work on and we would like to build on it as well. Thank you, sir. So, Akona, what about in South Africa? I believe you're working uh, quite closely with the South African government on solutions. Um, yes, I think we have been making quite an attempt, especially leading up to the conference, to get our, our government engaged. So we have worked on a youth water action plan, which um, brought together a couple of... Um, almost 100 young South Africans together to discuss the pressing and prominent challenges that we've seen. So up until now, we're still trying to obviously have a meeting with our ministers and the other officials from the department to speak about this water action plan. And also we are planning to host a post-conference symposium because I think what is frustrating in South Africa is that climate change gets more attention than water and sanitation. They're seen as two separate um, you know, challenges. So you've seen with the climate issues that there's a climate commission which has been established. You've seen um, there's a just, just, just energy transition um, framework and that is progressing, but water is being left behind. So I think, especially after this conference, I'm hoping that we'll have more conversations which bring young people to the forefront for water specific issues. So we have delegates being funded to go, for example, to the COP for climate issues, but we don't have young people being engaged when it comes to water and sanitation. And I think it's about time then we start um, prioritizing that challenge as well. And we always say that they're intersectional. So you can't look at climate change without looking at water as well. So, but yeah, we have been trying to progress. And because water is also nationalized in South Africa, it's very out of reach from civil society and the young people because um, it, it, there's no provincial um, organization or no provincial um, managers. So the, it's, it's the national ministry and then it's your local government um, implementing the, the, the strategies. So I think if we start also then making civil society involved and we work from you know the bottom up and grassroots and have more community based natural resource management management attempts and adaptive co management you know initiatives, then we would also empower people and young people from the ground to be you know taking part in the ward council meetings and local government management of the water resources. So I think we need to also just decentralize how water um, conversations happen in South Africa. So not just top down. Yes. <laughs> Yunia, are you working closely with the government in Uganda on uh, solutions there? Sure. Um, in preparation for this conference, uh, my network oversees more than 250 civil society organizations that solely work on water sanitation and environment issues in the country. So in preparation for the conference, uh, we were able to you know, generate uh, the key uh, priority areas that have been identified by the civil society organizations and make sure that at least that government um, incorporates them. So we're able uh, to work with government to make sure that the commitments that they're bringing here um, integrate well the civil society voice. So our co commitment going forward is to make sure, uh, first of all, um, as a network, to support in the coordination of the civil society organization initiatives um, so that uh, we can, government can have better data um, to help in targeting those who are unserved. Many of the civil society organizations contribute to um, uh, strengthening wash systems, whether in terms of policy development, for instance, Simavi supporting the government in developing the menstrual hygiene policy that is uh, helping to mainstream wash in schools. Then you have others enhancing on capacity building and local government. So we help to coordinate all these initiatives and then um, match them with government so that we can know who is doing what and where. So. Um, Post-conference, uh, 
we hope to, like I mentioned before, make sure that the commitments that we've tabled are followed through by the civil society, you know, continuing to be accountable, but also government ensuring that they fulfill and the donors ensuring that they support the financing of fulfillment, fulfillment of, these, um, of these commitments. So a quick fire round for all of you. Um, how optimistic are you that this conference will produce this much needed action? And we could start with you, please, Dr. Nasir. I'm very op op optimistic, you know. Uh, I, think, I think it's important for, as we have been speaking about, uh, for the youth, um, the government, NGOs, um, and also uh, the people who finance such, um, such uh, um, uh, large events. Uh, I, I, think, um, I think we will, through, through hundreds of um, side events and also presentations uh, and engagements, um, I think we would, we would be in a better position uh, to, um, for, for managers, for governments, and uh, the rest of us uh, to be uh, better um, to, to develop our policies, you know, in different capacities, you know, and, 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 and in different um, uh, situations. Um, I, I think we will be better off um, with this conference, I would think. Akona, what do you think? Are you optimistic? <laughs> I think I choose to be optimistic yet realistic because I've seen how much money has been pledged to South Africa through COP um, to help with the just energy transition. But we have seen the people on the ground um, not experiencing or, or still experiencing the challenges. So the loss and damage fund is not reaching the actual people who need it. So I think that's what also makes me a bit um, on the fence of where, how far I want to, you know, be hopeful is because I know commitments are always made at such big events and pictures are taken and, you know, all the speech, the grand speeches are given and headlines are, you know, published. But then when you get to the victims on the ground, they are still facing, you know, the challenges. The money doesn't filter down to them. So I think I'm very optimistic because there's a lot of effort um, the RVO from the Dutch government put into bringing us here and getting us, you know, to, at this platform, I, I got this opportunity to be on this talk show and also like being able to attend all the other side events as well and host one as well. So I'm optimistic about the ability to come here to the conference and experience the conference. But hopefully um, we can still in the next month, few months or the next year, we can still, you know, speak about the water conference and hold each other accountable to see the action also just come to life. You said accountability. Yunia, what about you? How are you feeling? Are you optimistic about uh, what results we might see here? Um, I really choose to be optimistic because we need to maximize on this opportunity that we have that's happening almost close to 50 years, you know, when we don't have a special session for water in the UN. Um, I think one thing we need to acknowledge is that um, addressing, you know, the need for water and sanitation is multi-sectoral, like we've been mentioning since, you know, with the other panelists. So this time we have on the table the key political leaders coming in to commit. We have other line ministries, Ministry of Health, Education, Agriculture, Energy, you know, gender coming in on the table. So jointly with the civil society, with the development partners, let's make sure that these commitments that we are making, you know, they speak to the ones that we've brought on the table, whether it's inequality or gender or climate change. And let's go back and we, all, we are all accountable to the commitments that we've individually made, but also hold others accountable. Thank you all so very much. Uh, here we've heard the word accountable uh, a lot in this discussion. We're gonna hear it a lot more in the next three days and moving forward. We are very hopeful that uh, these commitments, uh, this talking at this conference will indeed translate into uh, solutions for this crisis. Uh, thank you all for uh, showing us that water is linked to all our great challenges. Uh, you gave great examples of water and health, water and energy, water and gender equality, that there's more need for representation of women to be more involved in decision making and taking the lead, and uh, also for the youth and people of color to be better represented, and that we need cheaper, more affordable solutions uh, in the end, and uh, also that uh, there's, there's a shortage of investment in uh, uh, water-related uh, projects. Uh, and 
But uh, there is need, of course, for that investment to uh, go down to the people who need it the most and for governments to be talking to uh, different sectors and involving the different sectors of our communities. Thank you so very much, all our panelists, for an informative and engaging session. I wish you a very successful conference. A thank you also to all our viewers for tuning in. I will be back uh, at 2.30 p.m. New York time with our next talk show where we'll be focusing on the source to sea approach to managing water. We hope you'll join us then. For now, from me and the team, it's goodbye. <laughs>